Um, we take this opportunity to welcome everybody. Good evening, guests, students, faculty, alumni, colleagues, and friends. I'd like to welcome you to NYIT School of Architecture and Design's final lecture for this fall. I'm Associate Professor Naomi Frangos, and on behalf of Dean Maria Parbellini and my entire faculty, I'm very pleased to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Monica Ponce de Leon, Professor and Dean of School of Architecture at Princeton University and founding principal at MPDL Studio. It will be followed by a discussion moderated by Associate Professor Pablo Lorenzo Eroa here at NYIT. So as many of you have been following this fall, our series have been focused around the theme of fast forward making praxis. It is aimed at disclosing the strong undercurrents that drive our digital technology practices today and includes those who are forward thinking in terms of how practices can shape the future of design, how we as practitioners practice and how we define our identities through constructing our built environment. Monica Ponce de Leon's pro profound body of work exemplifies making praxis in an, an inclusive process that moves fluidly between the scaffolds of materiality, computational design, and critical theoretical positioning. From this working lexicon, she creates staged interiors, immersive surfaces, thresholds, portals, and perforations as opportunities for engaging the human senses through light, sound, smell, and touch, such as the suspended staircase as the, at the Conrad New York Conference and Event Center or the sculpted shell rooms of Boston's Bank restaurant. She reframes standards associated with the banality of fixtures, furnishings, finishes, and structure, composing with texture, rhythm, and shape, found in the woven mass of Tongxian Art Center in China or the Conrad Hotel at Battery Park. From 2008 through 2015, before joining Princeton, Monica Ponce de Leon was the Dean of Tobin College at the University of Michigan. For over 12 years, Ponce de Leon taught at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, where she became a professor and served as the Graduate Program Coordinator and was director of their Digital Fabrication Lab. Prior to her appointment at Harvard, Ponce de Leon was an assistant professor at Northeastern University, and she has been a visiting professor or scholar at various institutions across the United States, including SciArc, Rhode Island School of Design, University of Houston, the University of Miami, as well as Georgia Tech. At Georgia Tech, she was the first Thomas W. Ventulech III Distinguished Chair in Architectural Design. This year, in recognition of her extraordinary contributions in academia, Ponce de Leon was the recipient of Acadia's Distinguished Teaching Award. As a practitioner, Ponce de Leon has been honored with the National Design Award in Architecture from the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian National Design Museum, the Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the US Target Fellow in Architecture and Design from the United States Artists, and the Young Architects and Emerging Voices Prize from the Architecture League of New York. Her work has received numerous awards, including 13 Progressive Architecture Awards, 13 awards from the American Institutes of Architects, as well as the prestigious Harleston Parker Medal from the Boston Society of Architects. In 2016, Ponce de Leon was inducted into the National Academy of Design. She has a Master of Architecture in Urban Design from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, as well as a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Miami. So tonight, speaking on the agency of culture, Monica Ponce de Leon engages the praxis of architecture and addressing our power to shape, form, and transform space as the fundamental human experience in our world. So kindly, please silence your digital devices, and please join me in warmly welcoming Monica Ponce de Leon. Oopsie, okay. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. That was really beautiful, thank you. I mean it when I say the drawings are really light. If you guys sit in the back, you are going to be wasting your time. So I'm going to ask you one more time to stand up and actually huddle, come much closer to the front, because I do want you to get what I'm talking about. And hopefully there will be um, a lot of questions at the end, and maybe we can make it more of a conversation. And if there is something I say during the lecture that doesn't make sense, or if my accent is too thick, just interrupt me and say, excuse me, what do you mean? And we will just go through it. Um, so, I, um, 
So tonight I'm taking a little bit of a risk. I am presenting some uh, work that is newer, that is under construction, but I wanna put it in the context of uh, my larger body of work. And one of the things that I really firmly believe is that architecture plays a central role, a central role in the construction of culture. And um, what I mean by that is that architecture on the one hand materializes our aspirations and is the result of forces within society and forces uh, within a particular cultural context. But more importantly, architecture actually has the ability to push on those forces and propose alternatives to the status quo. So more than any other discipline, I would argue that architecture is actually very speculative. We not only can visualize and imagine a different present, which then becomes the future, but we actually have the ability to build it. We have the ability to materialize it. Um, and that happens through material culture, but it also happens through the way that we configure spaces. And this is, to me, very important. So historically, um, my work has been known in the context of aggregation and in the context, context of material assemblage. And I should say that all the work that I'm gonna show, um, what it very much reflects my interest is all done in uh, collaboration with a number of people over a number of years, and certainly in collaboration with those who are working with me in the office Today, Austin Ka just walked in and he, he runs the New York office, my tiny New York office. Um, so this obsession with materiality is one that very much bridges from the um, more low tech like brick. For a long time, I was invited to lecture about bricks all the time because we were known as the brick people. Um, and of course, into more contemporary topics like digital fabrication and in particular uh, robotics, which I'm sure we will talk during the question and answer uh, period. You know, but I actually think of both the low tech and the high tech as part of the same system of material production and a material production that places the architect in the world and that helps us actually um, place the subject in space and, and then bring to the surface how we actually occupy the world. And I think this is actually a very important topic today when the boundaries between private and public are so eroded and the distance between our head and the world is actually so immediate because of digital technology. This is a very early example of the use of digital technology. We were interested in the problem of precision and how you can use digital technology to produce what I would call a weird shape, um, but how that very same shape, um, because of our ability to manipulate digital technology, can produce a very precise figure from a single point of view. So the sheet metal that is folded in as an origami piece of paper, let's say, um, reconstitutes its flatness through the old technique of anamorphosis, but it's actually facilitated by digital production. Or the idea that you can take a material like stone, which historically has been about weight um, and heaviness, and you can use robotic fabrication as a way of making it very thin and light, but also as a way of registering the passage of time and using, using robotic fabrication as a way of embodying light within the material itself. And these are topics that um, very much I am interested in, the idea of how you register the passage of time and how certain tools allow you to change the expectations of a material, in this case in a World War II memorial that we're about to open next week actually in New Zealand. But how you can change the expectation of a material to become almost liquid, whereas in fact is uh, a solid. So I was invited by Georgia Tech several years ago to be the Ventulet chair. I was the first Ventulet chair at Georgia Tech. 
And I decided to take on the problem of digital fabrication in a series of uh, courses with students. And we did five installations in and around campus. This relationship between teaching and practice is one that for me is essential to uh, advancing the discipline and thinking differently about the material wor world around us. In other words, I very much believe in working with students in projects um, outside of studio in workshop format, but then using that as, an, as a way of anticipating different ways of thinking of the built reality, particularly in the context of the United States. So this, this was one of five installations that we did in Georgia Tech, and it actually had a huge impact on me. I was really obsessed with the notion of, can we develop a unit that can be assembled without scaffolding? I mean, if you think about any kind of assembly um, in building, you need the scaffolding to prop it up while, while you, before you fasten it. And what we did in this case is that we developed units that were all very different so that you could have any kind of shape. And the machine doesn't care what shape is cutting, so it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you repeat the joint so that those who are assembling it can actually figure, it, figure out how to put it together. Um, and that joint is the same type, but it's a different geometry. So the joint shape became what held the next piece and that allowed us to do away without scaffolding. So that kind of testing in academia is one that when we, we then deployed in uh, commercial projects, in projects in quote unquote the real world. Um, so the kind of testing and the kind of error and the kind of mistakes that we can make in the context of research then allowed us to develop uh, building methodologies that can then be deployed without risk um, in the context, again, of a project. This was very much the case when we were working on um, this gas station in Los Angeles, and we were asked to um, remodel an existing, existing ARCO station. But the tricky thing about this gas station is that um, it had an existing billboard that would pressure into the canopy. So we had the tension between the existing billboard and what was required by code, which were certain distances from columns to the edge of the canopy itself. When we were commissioned to do the project, um, the client wanted a prototypical gas station that could be repeatable. But what we learned through the process is that there is no such a thing as something that is completely prototypical. I mean, look at the weird site they gave us. How do you make a prototype out of something that has a billboard? Not every gas station has a billboard. Probably this is the only gas station that has a billboard. Um, and things like zoning and code. I mean, how many gas stations actually have the requirements of Los Angeles for overhangs, for example? So what we decided to do was to mass customize the components, and we thought of the gas station as a myriad of mushroom columns that were derived from a pure unit. And we use parametric uh, modeling as a way of designing these variations. So quite simply, we design a mushroom column that could then be adapted and distorted depending on its location on the site, whether um, it was under the pressure of the canopy or whether it was under the pressure of being at the edge um, or simply being fatter so that it could actually contain program like the place where you pay for your gas. But what allowed this seamless, seemingly, seemingly seamless transformation, of course, is that tectonic unit and a tectonic unit that could be adaptable, that could stretch or contract, um, so that the same exact column with the same number of components could actually take multiple figures and could, could, could lead to an overall character that would be in our minds memorable. Now, while most of my career has revolved around the aggregation of components, um, there has been moments in which I have been critical of this attitude towards architecture, where the part is something to be fetishized. So in this project here in Lower Manhattan, I mean here in, in Manhattan, um, I really wanted to work with the idea of the smooth and the seamless. 
and do away with the part. Um, it's a dining hall for um, in the middle of a skyscraper. And what we decided to work with was the notion of what to do, and you can't see this. Can you see this? No. Oh, that's too bad. Okay, I wanted to point to the ceiling, but this thing seems to have run out of battery. Um, so if you look at the ceiling, you will see that there is a there is a mess of things. There are the lights, there are sprinklers, there is HVAC, supply and return. And with the lights, you can see how messy they are, but normally in a ceiling, they're sort of all over the place. There is a reason why they're all over the place. What makes sense for lighting doesn't make sense for HVAC. What makes sense for HVAC doesn't make sense for the sprinkler head. So what we decided to do was to bring into the same line all of the different components. So within a three and a half inch gap, we had return air, supply air, sprinkler heads, uh, even cameras, etc. And we allowed the experts to place them on plan and then we connected the dots. So what seems like a whimsical and willful arrangement in the ceiling, right, the, the shape of these lines is actually defined by the prerequisite technical, um, by the technical prerequisites of the space. So this black line actually hides all of these components, and then the light is then uh, controlled in the same manner. Now, of course, this image already gives away the punchline in that there is no such a thing as the smooth, that the smooth is always made of the parts and that the smooth is actually an illusion. All architecture is made out of components. Um, in this case, the components were actually quite different in that, for example, this one was shaped to receive um, acoustical plaster called wasaphone, while the others um, are flat because they only have a skim coat, and then some are actually holes because there is a panel, access panel to above. Now, while I was obsessed during this project with the smooth, um, I couldn't resist myself, so if you look really closely, you'll see that it's actually a patchwork of different uh, finishes. The wasafunk has a lot of texture, um, and then the drop panels are actually very, very shiny. So there's, there's a little bit of a tessellation between the different systems that you can actually see if you look closely. So while Fabrication has, well, material culture, in my opinion, is at the center of what we do as architects. Um, I also want to emphasize the role that typological manipulation plays in the way that we, that we articulate a particular um, response to societal forces. So I'm gonna show three projects. Again, one uh, built right here in Manhattan, and then two, that are, um, one that was just completed actually recently, and then one that is under construction. And they deal with what I would s suggest are different prototypical um, problems in, um, in America today. So the first one is the typical single family home, and we can talk about the challenges of the single family home during the question and answer. But I was interested on the problem of the house and the problem of the house as it changes over time um, and how the house despite our animosity towards it as architects is no longer given for example as a problem in school has actually uh, maintained its cultural supremacy we still build more houses than anything else in america um, and actually is now it, re it, does, it no longer represents a high social status actually more middle class and lower income people living houses than apartment buildings. Apartment buildings seem to now belong to uh, the rich. So, so I was interested in the idea of the single family home over time and how to w manipulate the topology of the single family home as a way of registering this passage of time. Now, the next slide should really be a really ugly suburban home, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. So instead, this is a house that I think is, uh, for me, key to understand the mid-century modern movement and how the single family evolved within the architecture. It's an Elliot Noyce-owned house in Connecticut.
Connecticut. Those of you that probably don't know Elliot Noyes, uh, he was an architect practicing in Connecticut that actually was the head designer for IBM. He invented the typewriter, the Selectric. You might not know what a typewriter is, but it's the one that has the ball. It's pretty impressive. So this is his house for his own family. And um, in this case, I was confronted with the same problem, designing a house for my own family, which nothing could be more than a nightmare, but it's working out. So, so I, this house for me um, is a good reference point, a house in the woods, how to nestle the house in the woods, but still make it function within a certain, certain cultural context. So our house is closer to the street, so it has very much of a blank facade. Um, in a way, um, opening itself to the context in a different way than Elliot Noyes did. So what is interesting about the home is that you can, in a way, contain the history of architectural thinking within it. On the left is Philip Johnson's glass house. Um, on the right is Villa Malcontenta by Palladio, two very different ways of thinking about space. On the left is free plan, functional objects float within it. On the right is the idea of rooms that define spaces for humans to occupy, right? So um, I have always been interested in both and I have always been enamored uh, with the idea that with a desire for both. Um, so I thought of, is it possible to design, to invent a typology that actually oscillates and moves between the two? Another one of my obsessions has been Riedfeld's Schroeder House and how he designed it as an open plan that could then be transformed when privacy is needed. And I'm sure that you're all familiar with this plan. But it's very rarefied. Schroeder did it for, uh, sorry, Riedveld did it for Miss Schroeder, who was a divorcee with two kids. She lived by herself with her two children, and the children and her were extremely close um, in ways that are not flexible for different family types, for different individuals at different stages in life. So the question that I was posing um, through the design of the project was, it's possible to take this idea of transformation and scale it up. One of the critiques of the uh, American suburban home is that it's not flexible, that you abandon it and go to the next one, that when you downsize, you have to sell it. It becomes a commodity rather than something that changes with you over time. Um, so I like the idea of the Schroeder house as a model that maybe perhaps could be transformed for um, a larger context and respond to this idea of the change of the house over time. So we began with a flat plane and a series of objects and planes placed on that flat surface, flat, um, because my husband and I want to grow old in this house and we, don't, we, we have done enough work for older clients that we know that eventually going up and down the stairs becomes uh, impossible. Um, so design as an open space with objects, very much like, um, very much like um, the glass house where the objects contain those private spaces like bathrooms, uh, closets, etc. But design so that all the uh, doors are wall size and they're detailed like the walls. So here is where the detail of the architecture is important. The intent was that over the course of the day, doors open and close, doors become walls, walls open and close, um, so that you can actually transform the house over the course of a day from being a free plan to one of Pochet where rooms are clearly um, defined. So, with the intent, of course, that the house will then be filled with all of the different um, objects that we use in our domestic lives, and that is actually the objects that give character to each of the rooms. So there is actually an independence between the, um, the room itself and its function. They, they, what I've come to realize is that actually a room is only a bedroom because it has a bed and a room is only an office because it has a desk, but that actually this can be 
interchangeable over time if need be. So I'll give you a small example. So we've designed this as an office um, because we, we uh, well, we have a small office in New York and we actually have an office in Boston and an office in Ann Arbor. I, tend, I have younger children, I tend to not commute. So my husband and I tend to work out of home, currently kitchen table. Um, so the idea is that this will serve as um, an office. So it has the possibility of entering from the exterior through a separate door. The door, when, when closed, is flush and you will not know that it's there. But also we have a whole game of doors here so that when we're having a party, this can function as a guest room for the party. When my mother-in-law comes to visit, then we can close this door and then this becomes her bathroom. Um, when there is actually a client visiting us here, this is closed so that it's, the shower is not exposed to the client, etc. So, and like this, I could take you through the house through different examples of how we have configured the doors in excess as a way of anticipating multiple ways of thinking about um, the occupation of the house and hoping that if we even anticipate um, ways that we're not thinking of today. Um, so the, um, let's see. So one of the things that was important to us since it was a flat roof was to think of the roof as an elevated garden, um, very much a flat plane and the idea that we may act that we will access that new plane and becomes yet another ground extending the ground of the site um, but we did not want that plane to be neutral so while in the glass house and any other free plan configuration those objects those immovable objects stay free of the roof what we decided to do was that these objects should actually penetrate the roof and have actually an impact on the plane. In other words, that what may seem to be one of, one of the things that is interesting about the glass house is that the bathroom is dealt with as a floating object, but of course it's a bathroom, so it's very much fixed. There's nothing free about uh, that plan. So we wanted to use the roof as a registration of that, the, the lack of freedom of the free plan but also because it would allow us to create yet another landscape and expose the landscape of the roof as an artificial uh, landscape to be experienced over time. So, um, so then we started thinking of the house in terms of the long term. Um, and I have to tell you, my, my children hate this version of, I mean, this moment in, in the lecture. Um, because they imagine themselves in their room forever, uh, in the rooms forever. But you know that we would begin with two kids, each with a bedroom, our our master bedroom, office with direct ex access from the exterior. But eventually they'll move out, and we can rent their uh, bedrooms to uh, students. And actually, the quote unquote walking closet is is uh, outfitted so that you can bring a kitchenette as a piece of furniture in the future. So we're actually um, doing the gas and the water. The water comes from the bathroom now. Um, and then that actually over time, we may actually um, rent the office also as a unit so that we can stay on the house uh, in the long haul. We're also imagining a life after we're gone where our children may choose to actually divide the house into different apartments and this shows a myriad of configurations of how this would be possible. And the key to this transformation, again, is treating the doors as walls and the walls as doors so that you can actually transform it easily over time. And the current configuration anticipates these multiple versions. So the second example I wanna show is, um, um, is a public building and really dealing with the challenge of public building in America. Low budget, horrible site. This is the site, there's nothing there. Um, it's in a town called uh, Pompano Beach um, in South Florida. Pompano is really a wonderful community, but historically, Pompano has been very divided. 
So this diagram, I think, very clearly shows you the cultural context of the project. East of the railroad tracks here indicated in red is a relatively uh, affluent community um, that is primarily Caucasian. And then west of the railroad tracks are two communities, one that is primarily African-American, one that is actually more mixed between African-American and Hispanic. The original library was in the center of the, this neighborhood and the town decided to move it at the intersection between the three neighborhoods and to combine the library with a cultural center. Now what was super exciting to us about the project is that both the library and the cultural center separately got grants to embed technology within their programs. So the library actually is a pilot program to expose, expose youth to technology and technology is distributed throughout the building. There's a new media space in the library uh, and, and other ways of embedding technology. The cultural center similarly is a center actually for the teaching of technology uh, to the public at large, uh, for incubators to get started in the cultural center and for digital media arts, a black box for certain groups that do art through technology uh, to present it to the public at large. Now the cultural center and the library were separate clients, um, never in the same room at the same time, which makes for a fun client architect relationship. And we were asked actually to do a pancake, to have one floor be the library, another floor be the cultural center. Um, and throughout the process, there was a moment where we were asked actually to have the door of the library in the back of the building. Um, and what was really shocking about that is that we were also commissioned to do a public space in front of the building. So for the library to requ request the door in the back was um, for us really changed the way that we thought about um, public space and public buildings. So our solution was to uh, create a breezeway that would connect both sides of the building and thinking of the building almost like a Janus head, where there is no front and back, but both sides are somehow treated equally. And that led actually to a complete manipulation of the typology of the building. Rather than one program on top of the other, we designed, designed the program as snakes that embraced so that the cultural center climbs to the top and the library conversely climbs, climbs to the top as well. Um, so that um, really relied on the idea of a courtyard, but also relied on the idea of a breezeway, again, that connected the building from the front to the back. So you're actually able to see through the heart of the building from one end to the next, taking advantage of open space. This also allowed us to create a direct visual relationship between um, the programs um, of the cultural center and the programs of the library are, that are related. For example, here in the multi, in the media center, um, adults and children get to a certain level in terms of technical proficiency, and then there, you know, people suggest to them, oh, go to the other side and actually take formal classes. Um, so this kind of visual connection was one that was important for the program to actually function um, over time. The other advantage of the split is that it allowed us to put the noisy programs in the lower level in the front and then a more quiet reading room in the second level um, towards the parking. So this um, split level then really allowed us to work with the different kinds of constituencies in the site. One of the reasons that the library uh, director wanted the door in the back is because a big percentage of the users of the library um, are elderly and they drive to the library. And those are the folks that really wanted a quiet reading room. So the split allowed us to elevate it and create a still a visual connection between it and the rest of the project uh, while still providing the quiet. We worked very hard to understand what embedding technology meant. Um, and one of the things it means is less volumes, less books, 
but it also means that you can actually intersperse seating arrangements and uh, books so that there's a more direct relationship between reading and uh, social space in the library than conventionally, that you conventionally see. So the reading room then is really a mix of stacks and um, seating configurations that again create that more of a direct relationship between one and the other. The cultural center in the upper level is really an enormous flexible space that gets used in multiple ways from a more conventional theater arrangement to a centralized black box arrangement to weddings and quinceañeras. But more importantly, um, we were interested in the idea that the building is actually functioning differently at different times of day. And that the passage of time is actually something that the architecture needed to somehow register. So we worked with um, glass and stucco, which again is a very low, uh, it's a very low budget project. But we worked with glass and stucco so that depending on the time of day, the glass would reflect, reflect the, the sky and blend with the sky, and the building would acquire a certain figure while at night they would actually glow and announce the activities that were happening in the cultural center at night to the community at large. So the third and final project that I'm gonna show um, is the Conrad Hilton here in Lower Manhattan. Um, and I like starting with this slide because it's a 1936 film still from Alexander Korda's film, The Shape of Things to Come. And what is amazing to me is that in his stage set, Korda already embedded all of the things that um, have been part of the fascination with the Atrium Hotel in the 20th century. So the idea that you're going to somehow encapsulate nature. You can see the trees inside the space. The idea that you're gonna have, you know, the experience of an elevator that is open to the view so that you feel that acceleration of moving through the space. The repetition of the balconies one after another to create the impression of endlessness. Um, these are all the things that we associate with the Atrium uh, Hotel, but here we are in the late 30s when none of this had yet happened. Um, and of course, Portman is the master, and any of his hotels I think are amazing. He's, he's one of my favorite architects. And you can see here all of the elements that I just described, which really speak to an idea about the relation between public and private, and the notion that a private space may actually masquerade as public, and that these architectural features allow it to feel as if it's actually public, but in a way sort of more than public. Um, so if this is a poor man hotel, which has a certain beauty in its proportion, I'm sure people will disagree with me, this is actually what I got to work with. So we were asked to renovate Embassy Suites. I don't know if you were ever at Embassy Suites before the renovation. Um, it's really made out of drywall. You could knock on the walls and you will hear their hollowness. Um, so our project was to how to contend with this existing uh, condition. So while I make fun of the space, um, the, the location of the space was really remarkable. And we were, we were asked to collaborate with KPF in the building as a whole. They did the exterior, we did the lobby, and then we collaborated on the, the rooms. And actually, we did the lobby and all the public amenities. Um, the location is really remarkable. It's, of course, right next to the ferry, um, right across from the Potato Famine Memorial. Um, and it's part of a network of public spaces, like Scott Cohen's um, cover canopy, that really connect this area of the city, I would argue, quite, quite nicely. Um, but that space inside the building, the atrium inside the building, is actually severed 
from the public. It's a public right of way, as are all the lobbies in Battery Park. Um, so you are actually required to open a path 20, 24 hours a day through the building. But by having the public go up escalators and by having a ba visual barrier between the space and the ground floor, it actually feels and behaves as if it's private. So it's sort of an inversion of what an atrium hotel tends, tries to do. If an atrium hotel as a typology tries to pretend that it's public, even though it's private, in Battery Park, this is an actual public space, but it pretends to be private and keep people away. Um, the other complication is that Mary and Vasi are not parallel to each other. Um, so the difference in the geometry puts pressure in the project. And yet a third complication is that the hotel actually embraces an, um, a multiplex cinema. So the rooms are actually arranged around an atrium that is dealing with the pressure of the multiplex. So the previous owner dealt with this pressure by, by commissioning a soloed drawing to be applied to the box of the multiplex. Um, and this is what the space used to look like when we got it. And I would really encourage all of you to try to find where that right of way actually is through this space. Um, so you can see how there is elevators and you can see the lovely um, greenery <laughs> underneath the multiplex. Um, these, are, these are bamboo planters that were placed right underneath the solo wit. So our first impulse was actually to expand the space um, and free the belly of the multiplex so that it will no longer be a barrier in the space, but actually would allow to, will become a feature within the space. And then the second impulse is to actually connect the um, plaza, what we call the plaza, to the street. Um, so we int introduced grand stairs to the space and made the access to the elevators more obvious. So again, what used to be a barrier then becomes visually and physically connected. So the space went from this to this. Now, the big elephant in the room, so to speak, is the strange configuration of the atrium. If Borman has these grandiose spaces that are sort of accelerating, we actually were stuck with a space that was too small, but also stuck we were stuck with a space in which the solo width was really stuffed. Um, and I have to say that during the interview for the project, I did something really stupid in that I told the client that we should just paint the solo width. I am horrified that I ever said that. Now I really love the drawing, and I think it was one of the stupidest, most uh, considered things that I could say as an architect in my career. Um, Luckily, the, the client said, no, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> so he really challenged us to think about what we would do with the drawing if, uh, um, since we actually uh, should keep it. So our thinking was that the challenge of the project was how to frame the soldoid, and how to frame it um, it's a challenge because it could not be a conventional proscenium that you see from one single point of view. It really would become a three-dimensional problem, a multiple point of view proscenium. So we started thinking in terms of layering and we started thinking in terms of veiling and unveiling and the kind of um, sort of transformation that happens um, when you actually have different layers on a space. So it brought us back to the notion of nature and how to contain nature in the space. Um, and actually thinking very much about um, Dillers Cofidius blur building, which makes the building out of a natural phenomena. This of course is not possible in a place like an atrium in a hotel in, uh, in New York City. So instead we thought of the idea of hanging a series of bells that would allow you to still understand the overall of the space, but somehow uh, domesticated and encase a certain experience within it. 
it's, this project is very difficult to photograph and it's down the street. So, I mean, not literally down the street, but it's, it's accessible. So forgive me for showing um, photos for something that you may uh, see better in person. Um, so the combination between freeing the bottom of the soloette and hanging the bells really actually gave the soloette a proper place in the space. Um, and it, al it allowed it to really be an object that commanded um, a volume that commands the site. It's very much, for us, it was very much a part of a certain network of pieces of art throughout uh, these two to three blocks. And we felt that it was important that the bells be really calibrated so that they fit well within the atrium but also related to the soloet. So, the point of departure was, on the one hand, the geometry of the site, but on the other, the existing uh, structural system in the front of the atrium, which was triangular. So we simply took that triangular shape and repeated it, and then we went ahead and sliced it as a way of opening different uh, points of view with the intent that each slice through the through the projections will then expose different ways of experiencing uh, the soloet. The, what gives shapes to the veils is actually rings at the bottom of each of them. Um, and the rings, of course, then develop a conversation with the drawing uh, itself. That what seems, again, whimsical, it actually was calibrated as a way of compressing the space when you're sitting down, but actually expanding the space as you go up uh, into it. We also worked very hard to uh, modify the balconies. As I said at the beginning, the balconies of the original embassy suites really bother me. Um, and what we did is that we actually shaped them so that they will work with the view, the idea that you can actually look down as opposed to lean out in order to see. Um, but also they were shaped um, acoustically so that they, the shape at the bottom reflects sound more than the shape at the top so that you can actually now have a conversation um, in, the, in the lobby. And I think that that is more evident, I would say, in this picture than in, than in others. So the experience in uh, each floor is actually slightly different. Uh, depending on where you are, you have one experience or another. And the elevators are actually concealed behind perforated panels. So they're no longer that present in the space while you still experience um, the, the movement of going through it up and down. So Veils became uh, one of the themes. So while we hung the veils in the atrium, we also decided to hang uh, a stair in the conference center. But in the case of the stair in the conference center, we, uh, we um, worked with the geometry of the site itself, again, using Murray and Bassi as alibis for producing an interesting geometry for the stair that brought the city, in a way, to the heart of the building. In this case, the suspended stair is clad, the, the cable system of the suspended stair is clad in wood as a way of making it more accessible and more, uh, if you wish, domesticated. Um, so you may have noticed in previous drawings that the top frame of the veils started as a flat plane. Um, and then we realized that we needed to have open space for the cleaning basket to clean the skylights in the atrium. And that was the beginning of the shaping of the top of the veils, again, so that they will keep good company with the um, soloed drawing. So, um, So uh, they don't allow people in the elevators. Sometimes you can convince them. So I thought I would bring what I call my B-movie video of going up and down uh, the elevators so that you get a sense of what it is to be in the space. 
So one of the greatest compliments I've ever gotten as an architect is I was checking into the hotel and they trained the staff to know who did what. So they saw my name and they realized it was me. And they said to me, I, we have to tell you a story. A, a, a mother with her little boy had checked in a couple of weeks before and the little boy turned, you know, was excited looking at the space and then he turned to his mom and said, mom, where is Spider-Man? Which for me as a mother was like the best compliment I have ever gotten. So thank you very much. This is the end. And I don't know if you want questions before we sit down or do we sit down first or, okay. Thank you for uh, such a nice lecture. I like, um, well, I, I, I'm a big admirer of your work. Oh, uh, I, I've been following um, your work early from the 1990s, middle 1990s. Uh, I'm from Argentina. So um, we, you know, in, in, in Latin America, and I think that maybe perhaps you share a little bit of this, um, the relationship between architecture and typology is kind of mediated through materials in a way, right? Um, and I thought that the interesting thing about your lecture is that you started with the earlier um, experimentation with materials, then you show the, perhaps the, you know, the, the gas station is um, something in between materials and typology, then you focus a little bit on the house, which is an experiment on, really on typology in itself, and then you finish with a project that um, to me is very interesting because it, it addresses materiality, but with the aim of transforming the typology of the atrium, right? So uh, there is a very interesting sequence in that and there are many problems that, uh, that the one derives into the other. And I would like to maybe to, to, to talk a little bit more about the relationship between um, bottom-up design from materials reaching up to maybe higher organizational problems, right? Emergent higher organizational problems such as typology. And the other way around, I'm thinking in terms of typology, typology which is perhaps a, a top kind of like a hierarchical problem in architecture and how you uh, derive into a problem of materiality. Can you explain a little bit more perhaps what is the relationship in your work in terms of those two worlds that I think that you're your office and your practice has historically addressed that in a very interesting uh, way. So it's messy. You know, when, when you give a lecture, you show everything in a nice order, and it was very intentional. I mean, I'm so happy that you sort of have outlined the structure of the lecture because it was very intentional to do it that way. Um, but, it's, but it's not necessarily chronological, and it's not necessarily a scalar. The, the relationship between, let's say, a, a unit, um, a material unit, and a building as a whole, is not that you start with the material and then you end up with the building, or vice versa, that you end, start with the plan and then you end up with the unit. Depending on the project, it goes one way or another. Sometimes they're both at the same time. Um, but to me, that, that coincidence between the function of the project and its building type, I mean, the the, the, sorry, be, the coincidence between the building type and the unit is very, very important. There's a project that I didn't show today, which is an apartment building in Boston, and we used, um, we've used we used a staggered truss system, which is used for Howard Johnson's. It's rarely used in mid-rises, but we used it because it was cheap. And the only way you know that the structure is a staggered truss is because we design the facade to give you a hint of that structure behind. So the, the, the panel system that we chose and the way that we deployed it actually spoke of the type. The house will not work if the joint of, if the hinges don't work, right? The, um, the veils would, I mean the space certainly in the last project will not work if the fibers were not translucent, which is what makes it difficult to photograph but if the fibers were not translucent and therefore dematerialized depending on how the light hits them, 
the space will not work, right? So that direct relationship between the particular effect of a building site and its materiality for me, they come hand in hand. But it's not a sequence. It's not that one comes first and the other one comes last. No, it's interesting. Um, to me, the, but there, there is a, a very specific problem in that relationship in the gas station, right? Because you said that um, on the one hand, you have a certain uh, material logic, right? A certain systematic way of constructing the project. And on the other hand, you have the specificity of the site. So then you resolve the relation between the, if you want, the, the typological problem, which is the column, the ma you call it the mushroom column, right? The relation between the column and the ceiling in terms of an elastic uh, relationship, right? And then uh, the material, in a way, plays a, a certain performance in terms of the the size of the tilings that allows you to stretch uh, the typology at up to a certain limit. So in that project, I, I found that very interesting, uh, perhaps the exploration between uh, a systematic way of thinking construction, right, relative to an organizational problem, right, because they, it seems that they are very tied with each other in a very specific way. Um, but I don't know if you want to say anything about, about that, because I'm particularly interested in that, in that specific problem. But there is something disappointing about the gas station okay. and something that is haunting me and I have tried to pursue in other projects that have not been done. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, there's one project right now on the table that I'm hoping will be the project where we pursue it. And is that it was an existing gas station. So it's actually a conventional steel frame. So the system we developed was really a system of cladding, cladding. right? It's not a structural system. It really is divorced of structural logic. And I'm not a structural theorist. I actually like Seagram's better than Farn Farnsworth. I like that Seagram's hides the structure and that the I-beams that you see are window mullions are not structure, right? Um, but there is still something somehow unsatisfying about the mushroom column, and it's a misnomer, it's not a column, the cladding that pretends to yeah. be a mushroom column. There's still something satisfying to me about that lack of relationship in that particular case between the structure and, uh, and the canopy. But still, I mean, it's organizing the space. So yeah. structural, I mean, you can talk about structure in terms of uh, spatial organization, yeah. structure in terms of tectonics, but uh, I, I was thinking it in, that, in those terms that it was organizing the space uh, through. I mean, to me, what, what's, what's interesting about the project is that, um, that topology is the, the kind of liaison, right, between the, a material system that has a certain kind of requirements and uh, a certain plasticity on your behalf as a designer to understand what are the conditions that you can move, right, and what are the conditions that perhaps uh, have a, a different kind of relationship. But that, I would say that that's common to all the projects. Yes. It's more evident in the gas station because the triangular geometry is so loud, because it's cladding the joint, is more clear, but for example, in the dining hall, where we're working with a smooth surface, that plasticity between the unit and the hall is very much there, and perhaps even more plastic, because it's not based on vectors, right? Yeah. It's based actually on the, on the spline, but it's still a tectonic unit that stretches and compresses. Um, and it's the same for the wood pieces, and it's, I mean, it's, it's the same even for the house. In the house, we're working with um, a certain size board and actually uh, using different si size boards and different orientations as a way of turning corners and as a way of, again, hiding the presence of the doors. No, it's interesting. To me, the, the you know, one of the, maybe to give a, a little bit of context to the students, um, one of the radical work of, um, of, of uh, Office DA in the beginning and now your office uh, independently uh, at least from, from my point of view, from being a, somebody that I'm, I'm interested in construction systems through fabrication and uh, computation, was the radical take that you took in the earlier, I mean, maybe mid-1990s, uh, earlier 2000s, uh, which actually I, I developed an article in, uh, a critical article on um, Greg Lin's Archaeology of the Digital, in which your work is included. And uh, um, it is it's very interesting because you were, you were one of the, the first, uh, if you want, experimental architects to deal with materiality from a computational point of view. Uh, it didn't exist before, right? In the 1990s, I mean, for those of you that are a little younger, 
Uh, in the 90s, right, the, uh, the digital was just about the virtual. It was not about the material, right? And your office started thinking, uh, perhaps even from a Latin American perspective through aggregate systems, through BRICS, right? Started thinking about uh, materials, what happens with material systems? What happens with material systems in relationship to computation? And in reality, I mean, from, at least from my point of view, and when I, when I ar argue in this article, is that that presented a hinge, right? Uh, from the utopian kind of 1990s visions about uh, ideal, if you want, radical spaces to the construction of that uh, utopia, right? Like what happens when you have to, you have to build these things uh, and uh, open up, uh, I think that your work really opened up a very different uh, way of understanding what was radical and at a very specific point in time. Uh, that perhaps today, uh, in a way, we are in a, in a, in a, at the end of that process because it's, it's more normalized. But at the, at the time, it was very radical. Uh, so I would, like, I would like to to have a specific question because I know I know you you've been talking a lot about it. But perhaps uh, the question has to do with representation. How do you think these things uh, in terms of computer representation? Yes. So. Can I say something yes, before sorry. I answer the representation question, which I think is a very important question today. Um, you know, it's interesting, the, the, the connection between the digital and fabrication did not come out of asking how are we going to build these things. And in fact, it did not come out of that. And in fact, I would argue that my interest in digital fabrication was in parallel with the development of uh, softwares and it was really more a question of how does the digital, how can the digital impact material culture? Very much I believe that one of the things that we do as architects is have an, you know, is we impact through material, through the physical, through the here and now. So I was more bored with geometric experimentation that was devoid of materiality, and I was more interested in how it tied to materiality, right? But I always, but at the end of the day, um, and this is why I like showing the dining, the dining project, the dining hall project. I didn't want it to become also a fetishization of the unit. I thought that that was a dead avenue. That it should work. It should be able to oscillate between working with tectonic units of all kinds and shapes, but also be able to hide the presence of the tectonic unit. So I, I hope that that makes, that distinction to me is important, so I hope it makes sense. The question of representation is, uh, to me, really interesting. Uh, you know, I, like every architect, I hate renderings. Like every architect, every so often a client comes and says they want a rendering. Um, and it, you know, you enter progressive architecture, and if you don't have a rendering, you don't get a freaking progressive architecture, which is a problem. So always the rendering, the rendering, the rendering, and I, I I think you saw in the, and it's a, quest, it's a conversation that we're all having. I think that you saw in the presentation, I have resisted perspective. For the longest time, we were known as the people that drew perspectives, but they were constructed the old fashioned way by hand. So as soon as rendering in perspective became the thing, I switched into orthogonal representation. So all the renderings that we do are actually elevations or sectional, um, or sections through the building with a rendering in the background, as opposed to sectional perspective, as opposed to um, a, 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 pers you know, a perspective rendering. I don't feel compelled to represent the future in the drawing in a literal way, in a photorealistic way. So the intent has always been to represent a mood more than the actual space. But, but uh, my, my question was a little bit more referring in terms of um, material behavior. Is there any anything that you guys are thinking in terms of uh, how to anticipate uh, materiality? Because I know that you come from very hands-on into materials, right? You, you Then in the 1990s, you, you went uh, into digital fabrication in terms of uh, going against the logic of the material, which to me was really radically yeah. very interesting, right? Like about the stone projects that you show, yeah. you were saying, you, I want to embed uh, fluidity within a very solid, rigid uh, material, right? Which is- You mean the representing the material itself? Well, or how do you deal with, co with computation in terms, like, you know, now we have simulation of material behaviors and so on. Is there anything 
that you're looking in terms of the relation between fabrication uh, and the representation of uh, a certain anticipation of the, of the behavior of the material relative to the construction system. I am less inter interested in the literal um, use of technology as a way of anticipating a particular behavior. Mm. Um, but I am definitely interested in um, using materials as a way of exposing how stereotypes are incorrect. In other words, if you can make a brick feel like fabric, right, then anything is possible. That means that we're not fixed, that reality is not fixed, that reality is changeable, right? If you can make stone feel very, very thin, then again, that means that none of the stereotypes out there in the, in the world are, are the, the way that we think of ourselves as humans is not fixed, right? So this has definitely been a, a gre of great interest um, to me. But I'm less interested in the technical testing of the behavior of a material. The experimentation has always been about, in a way, low tech, to be honest. How to use digital technology to produce really new effects in an affordable way. No, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I didn't mean it in, in, in a technical way. I meant it in, this, in the way that you're explaining, which is to open up uh, emergent problems, right? Which is to challenge our categories, right? To challenge how we think about reality. I, I really appreciate that about, about your work. Uh, my last uh, question, just before opening up to, to the public, is it's a very different uh, dimension, which is um, I, I happen to know about you, about an article that you wrote about uh, Gioponti, right? About uh, uh, Casa Ballard? Val, uh, uh, Casa Blanchard. Blanchard, sorry, in, uh, in Venezuela. It's article, it's an exhibition. It's an ex I ah, okay, did I didn't know. The Cover Museum nice. and Harvard is a all-consuming. So it has, it's related to your work as a curator, as a person that writes about architecture, and now you're uh, the dean of uh, the School of Architecture at Princeton University, which I, I attended to, and which is heavily rooted in theory, right? Uh, I just wanted to, maybe to, you to talk a little bit, uh, and also you, of course, you were the curator of the US Pavilion with Cynthia Davidson. Mm -hmm. um, so you do a lot of work that, uh, that border, you know, borders between theory mm -hmm. on the one hand, and on the other extreme side, right, materiality, right? Yeah. So you're like and in really extreme. Even more extreme is clients, right? Right. right. So uh, I'm very interested in that. Uh, you, you, it's almost as if you're you're taking further than anybody else uh, <laughs> that relationship to a certain kind of synthesis. If you can talk about that. So, I mean, we all do what we want to do. You do what you love. You do what gives you pleasure, right? So I have. And by the way, this is the advice that I give younger faculty when they come to me and they're like, should I do this or should I do that? How do I get tenure? You do what you love. So I have to confess, I do these things because I love it. I enjoy it. It gives me pleasure, right? I chose Gio Ponti the same way that I chose Villanueva. And it's interesting where my life took me, actually, because I did this when I was an assistant professor. I did two shows at the GSD. One in the work of Gio Ponti and then one in the work of Carlos Raúl Villanueva, who is a Venezuelan architect from mid-century, um, because they both actually were curators, were architects, wrote about architecture, were professors, were deans, and both of them ended up being deans of their respective schools. So, so it's interesting that I, I ended up actually becoming. I never planned to, but it's, it's sort of funny to look at it. Um, so my answer is that actually I do it because I love it. And I, did, I do think it's all part of building architectural culture, and it's all part of constructing conversations that allow the discipline to be advanced, supporting younger generations so that they can find their voices, and ensuring that they keep you know, the older generations thinking and keep us you know, fluid and ahead. Um, so I don't see them as separate. You know, I see it all as one and the same. When Cynthia and I did the... Um, um, the pavilion, the American pavilion at the Venice Biennale, we commissioned um, a whole mix of architects to do a speculative projects for the city of D Detroit. And everybody asked me, how come you didn't do one? You're a designer, why are you acting as a curator? Well, actually, because I, it was too close to home. You know, I had been there for a long time. But also, I really wanted to construct with Cynthia the conversation as opposed to embed my own design thinking into, into that moment in time, because I thought it could, it could actually open up a different kind of relationship. 
between design, speculation, and what I consider a very pressing urban uh, problem. So I don't mean to be boring, but it's really because I love it. <laughs> right. and, and what about Princeton? Like, how do you see the future of the School of Architecture? So, you know, I, I was at Harvard for a long, long time. It's my alma mater. Um, in a way, I could say I'm a Harvard girl through and through. But then I became dean at the School of Architecture at the University of Michigan. And you know, now I watch football games every Saturday and I can you know, sing the fight song and I, I, we have a scholarship. I love the University of Michigan. Um, so all of you who are thinking of masters, think of Princeton, but also think of Michigan. Um, and Princeton in a way is diametrically opposed to Michigan. It's small, Michigan was huge. Um, it was time for me to move into a direction where, I mean, what I like about the small size is that I think this is a moment where we actually need to have a more intimate conversation about architecture, this kind of format where we can actually dwell into questions more deeply, um, which is difficult to do the larger format, and I had done the larger format for a long time. So I see Princeton as the possibility of actually exploring uh, topics very deeply because of its size, and I hope that then those topics travel outside of the boundaries uh, of the school. And we've been doing it in a multitude of ways. One is the lecture series is thematic, um, and we actually give the video of the previous speaker to the current speaker so that they feel compelled to respond. Not always works, but it's a way of doing it. We have dinners with the speakers, where the students go to dinner with the speakers and continue the conversation. Different students do different things, which is great. Last semester, some students um, organized like a pop-up um, roundtable discussion about the series. Um, other students sometimes invite two people at the end of the series to do, be respondents, and then we're publishing, uh, we're, we're gathering publications around these topics. The exhibitions program has been super important. Um, again, what I call material evidence, not looking at things online, but actually looking at drawings, models, samples of materials, having them physically for us has been very, very important. And then constructing a symposium and uh, other kinds of conversations around that physical evidence. For We had an Aldo Rossi show a year ago. We just had an, Michael Meredith just curated an exhibition on on houses um, where the students built models all at the same scale, all in the same room of 44 houses. So I don't know, Sylvia Levin brought postmodern fragments of buildings into the gallery and did a show that then ended up at the CCA. So we're small um, and some of the stuff that we do doesn't, um, doesn't seem to be a big deal, but then you know it's interesting when you look back the energy that the school is getting, so. Great, all right. So now we open up to the floor to see if anybody has any comments or questions. Um, we have a microphone going around. Yes, there is. There is another one. Well, thank you, Monica. No, yeah, it was no, very my nice. Pleasure. Um, actually, some of my students are uh, working on houses the way that you're thinking about the house, like in That's terms right. of Airbnb, shared space, and, and multi-generational. So it was very My daughter says she's going to rent her room after she moves out <laughs> so that I don't rent it to somebody else, which is pretty funny. It's a very interesting problem. And she's only 13, you know. Exactly. Anybody? My students, I have some students here, yeah. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask you a question. I actually admired the idea of like turning uh, walls into doors. I wanted to ask you, how would you imagine that being in, let's say, an apartment building? How would that impact each apartment if we changed um, walls into doors? You mean if like all the apartment units were connected? Yeah. Like how would yeah. that kind of impact life and how would that impact them socially per se? Yeah, so that you can like keep on growing or shrinking. And yeah. Yeah, that's totally doable. That's a great thesis. <laughs> That's a good topic for your thesis. Or, or, or actually for the house that you're designing in the studio <laughs> now. We'll see. <laughs> Thank you. Please. 
Marcella. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, but uh, for the video. So thank you for the great lecture. So I have a question related to actually the uh, talking about culture and relates to the title of your lecture. Um, so I completely agree. I think you know you show this all scale and full scale. I think of your practice. So starting from material bottom up, starting from the material in terms of uh, the driver of the process of the work, but also looking at the whole spectrum of, of your work in terms of different scales of project. Um, so my question relates to again looking at architecture as a cultural practice and uh, also related to tools, specific tools in which, in a way, your work is rooted. Uh, so I'm wondering if you can expand on uh, culture, relation to materiality, and relation to tools as well. So we have been talking a little bit about representation, but I'm wondering how uh, uh, looking at your practice, as again, as the architecture, as a cultural practice, how the tools start to be embedded in the process. The, you know, the, the question of the tool, I think, is a really, of course, important one today. And how and when to deploy digital fabrication, but how and when to challenge construction norms, how and when to deal with the low budget. I mean, I like showing the low budget projects because there's no space for, um, there's no space for anything but form, interestingly enough. The low budget projects are the ones where form is the only thing that you can work with because there's no detail. Um, so, so I think that the um, one of the potentials for digital fabrication, and I didn't focus on this on the lecture, but you have seen me speak about this, so maybe this is what you're thinking with your question, is that we have the ability actually today of mass customize. And we have the ability actually to produce variation within projects that may actually re reflect a multitude of public as opposed to a single public. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that I'm very interested in, the library at Rhode Island School of Design. That was the topic um, of the project, how to actually create repetition and variation in a way that made all different kinds of um, users somehow embedded in the in the space. But that's not something that you can do in every project, in every condition, right? So sometimes actually it comes down to very simple, I mean the way that architecture has power comes down to very simple choices. Scale is one, fighting for the size of a room so that it's truly public. Um, the location of a door, I like telling the story of the cultural center door they, they, it was a big fight actually when they told us that they wanted to put the door in the back because I was horrified. Who puts a door in the back? This is ridiculous, right? You don't put the door of a public building in the back of the building as opposed to the plaza. Yeah. I mean, this is outrageous. I even told the, the head of the library that he was gonna be known as giving his back to the community. Yeah. And he said, well, I don't wanna be known as giving my back to the community, but can you please put the door in the back? <laughs> So the typological invention actually came out of that challenge of understanding that I needed to actually have two doors, not one, that they needed to somehow be connected through an open air uh, space. So something as simple as the location of a door has enormous cultural consequences. Mm -hmm. And actually the struggle of the doors is very much the struggle of Pompano Beach. It's really, you know, African-American mothers that come by bus, therefore come through the front and elderly retirees that are Caucasian, that drive, that park in the back, right? So that was really the tension in the project. And we wanted to not just simply expose the tension, we actually wanted to resolve the tension through the typology. And we worked very hard, actually, with the community to arrive at something that everybody could be proud of. The idea that you can see the front, the, the quote unquote back door from the front, that is covered so that you don't get you don't have to work, walk extra in the rain. Um, so, so even something as the typological manipulation of a project is very much embedded mm -hmm. in uh, how we approach and how we impact a cultural context. I hope that that answers the question. Any other question? Yeah, there.
Hi, great lecture. Thank you very much for that. Um, I was wondering on your cultural center library project, uh, you thought of, uh, you, when you were thinking about designing the library, uh, it was gonna be mostly used for elderly people. And you wanted to have it on the quiet side of the building. What would your thought process have been, or like redesigning have been, if it was designed for, say, grammar school for children? I explained the library wrong, if this is the impression that you got. Okay. So the library was interesting because half the users were retirees who went to the library to sit in the reading room and read quietly because they wanted to be in a public space that was safe. The other half actually um, were children whose mothers used the library as a daycare center. So the library in America today is not about books. The library in America today is the last bastion of public space. So those who have less resources and cannot afford daycare, after school, they tell the kid to walk to the library and to hang out in the library so that the kid can be safe and then the mother picks them up because the mother is working, right? Or the father, I should say. But in Pompano, the, ten, the, ten, it, the, the statistics are that it, te it tended to be mothers. Okay. So actually, the, the, the retirees complain that in the old library, they could not actually enjoy the space because the kids were too loud, mm -hmm. right? And the kids complained that they were made uncomfortable by the older folks that were all constantly going on them, right? So that was very interesting for us to see in the old building. So the, the snake shape allowed us to maintain a single related library and we put the, um, the circulation desk at the, at the Nexus as a double height space. It allowed us to actually connect the two spaces, but give them enough separation that the kids could go wild at one end and it would not really bother the other, the other group. Okay. So. Thank you. Another question. Yeah. Can you pass it? Yeah, so um, in relation to what you said about materials, that you are more interested in using digital fabrication to push the, the, the limits or the capacity of a material, like a rigid block, and then you're trying to make it more thin and then more flexible. So I'm, I'm just trying to say, so if then you can push a block to be more flexible and the way it, it reacts in its normal state, then can it be used to replace like maybe ceiling cladding or um, ceiling panels so that maybe like your, the whole building is gonna be made of just one material instead of spending money on so many materials so that like it's just one material that has different um, iterations of how it's made. And then you know you cut cost in that way. That's what I'm thinking. That sounds like a good thesis for you too. <laughs> You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a series of houses that uh, me and my partner at the time designed, one after the other, um, where we we were very much interested in this question. So one was wood, and we went, we did, we transformed clapboard into louvers. Um, another one was terracotta block, which we transformed from solid to open. Um, and from flat to uh, flexible. Right. So we were very much interested in, another one was corrugated metal that went from being sort of solid and panelized to being curvilinear because the corrugation allows you to do this. So this uh, very much has been one of my obsessions. We just built a little pool house where I'm working with uh, shingle and actually having the shingle read as if it's rubber. Um, so I, this is something that is very much an obsession of mine, how to allow a single material to perform in multiple ways and to juxtapose them. Yeah. So that, um, again, so that it makes you think differently about the physical reality that we embody um, and expose how um, reality is not, is not fixed. But at the same time, I'm very accepting of the different constraints of every project. Um, I'm not a stubborn architect. If, an, if a client says, no, don't go that way, go this other way, I'm happy to try to imagine yet one more thing, right? 
So, but I think you're proposing a wonderful thesis for yourself. <laughs> Maybe interject just a little comment because uh, this comes back to a pro uh, question I wanted to ask you before. What about 3D printing? Like, uh, you know, about continuity. Do you have any anything to say? Because, I mean, you you talk about assemblage. I mean, you could you could practically go through the history of your projects in terms of different uh, means of understanding the relation between materiality and representation. And with 3D printing, and you said, you know, very clearly, we don't we don't think about uh, the project and then how to build it, right? In in Latin America, that's the way of thinking, right? You think through the resources and through the materiality, and that arises to the logic of the project. How do you think about 3D printing? So I can't think of, I can't answer the question without thinking of my academic history. Um, I have always been interested in having multiple tools at all of our disposal and deploying them differently. Um, and at the GSD, I was the one that pushed for getting the C core printers and then getting another type of printer and having more, you know, the, the having different um, the ABS, having different kinds of printers to do different kinds of things. It's not, but but this is as an academic, as a researcher and as a I mean, that's as a dean, as a as a how do you call it, as a bureaucrat in charge. But as a researcher and as a designer, I tend to be interested in cheaper things, to be honest with you. And 3D printing is still, still is still expensive. I think that, for example, what uh, Virginia Virginia Sanfratello is doing is fantastic. Do you know her work? Yeah. They are they are taking coffee leftovers and corn leftovers and India, actually. they're they're doing amazing things. So so I haven't yet. Um, I haven't yet found the proper project to explore it, but I think it's a I think it's a fantastic avenue. Yeah, more affordable, uh, affordable. Once it becomes more affordable, I mean, I then it'll become more interesting. Then you have the very interesting issue between low tech and high tech, right? Yes. Uh, that is also another issue. Yes. But there's uh, somebody there that wanted to ask a question. Yes. Yeah. That's another one. You know, while we wait for the microphone, one of the reasons I became interested in. Uh, digital technology is because it was already very widespread. So I was, the first project that we built, I designed to be built with a table saw, and then I realized that it was not, the way I detailed it didn't work with the way that they were drawing, and then I was trying to understand what is, why, how are they building this? And it was a very, you know, low, 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 uh, it was not a high-end shop, it was a cheap project. And I realized all the mill workers in the East Coast already were using CNC routers. And that's actually what opened my mind to, oh my God, what are we doing? You know, we're missing out in a way of thinking about construction. So. Yeah. Hi, hello. You spoke about the multiple use of space, um, the same space with different setting. Yes. But, and you also spoke about um, the passage of time. Yes. And that for me, it's, it's interesting. Can you elaborate more on this concept? Yeah. You know, we tend to think of typology as producing fixed relationships between a space and quote unquote its function. But if anything, if we have learned anything in the last 50 years is that this is not true. Buildings are constantly changing. The rooms that were designed for one thing end up being used for something else. Um, so I'm interested in how the passage of time actually affects the way that we perceive and use space and how the materiality of the space either enables the transformation or precludes the transformation. So a lot of my more recent work is really um, dealing with this interest that, that the materials actually enable the transformation of the space over time as opposed to become a barrier for its, its transformation. Um, again, in the, in the house, the rooms are basically the same, and one can function as a bedroom, or one can function as a studio, or one can function as an office. Um, two bedrooms may relate and become an apartment, or two bedrooms may be separated and become two different units, right? And is the, mat the materiality of them is what would make it possible, or what would, what would preclude Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I had a question in regards to the um, library. 
What were your design considerations for um, kind of the facade uh, as well? I mean, you mentioned the passage of time was quite a, uh, relevant for that, but in regards to the materi materiality of that, if you could just uh, talk a little bit more about that and how that uh, process went. So it is Florida. It's a really low budget project. I mean, it, it's really crazy how low budget the project is. So we knew that we were gonna be working with stucco and glass, less glass than stucco, again, because it's Florida. One of the things that the client groups told us from the very beginning at the public meetings, what the community will tell us from the very beginning is that they did not want an international style building and they did not want a Mediterranean style building, which is sort of funny. And the reason was that Mediterranean style really represented a particular social class and a particular ideology in Florida. Um, and the international style similarly was associated with a certain social class and a certain sort of, um, a certain moment in Florida that Pompano did not want to be associated with. So that was one thing. And then the other thing that they said um, was that they did not want a box, which is pretty, again, you're dealing with a very low budget project and they tell you they don't want a box. <laughs> so, so the shape of the building um, is a combination of code that requires certain slopes for the roof to drain water, um, trying to um, use the relationship between the lower levels and the upper levels, the staircases, as a way of giving figure to the building so that you could break the box. Um, and then really playing with the idea of the breezeway by developing those very sharp uh, columns, the unusually angular uh, columns that really gave directionality to the project from one side um, to the next. Then, I, going back to the question of the passage of time, one of the things that I really was obsessed with was the glass, and it's again very cheap glass, but I think at the end it worked out that depending on the type of day, the glass really blends with the sky, but then at night it glows, it's frosted, so it's not transparent. The, there's some windows that really give it depth. Um, so making sure that sometimes the glass is in a way confused with the stucco, and then sometimes the glass is confused with the sky, depending on the time of day. It's particularly important in that project because the cultural center, the black box, is not in use during the day. It's dead up upstairs, right? But at night it comes alive. So that idea of the light um, marking the use of that second floor was important but making it not stucco so that it's not a solid dead volume, which is what black boxes normally normally are. I hope that that answers the question. All right, it's getting late. So thank you, Monica, for uh, the discussion and the presentation and finishing with time. You know, time is a, it was very particularly very interesting what you said about the materials enabling uh, the time in the building. So thank you again thank for your you. presentation. Thank you so much. Yeah.